Welcome to the Here's Hope Project, where your story creates hope. I'm Sarah Jane, and today we're going to speak with Rachel, who has a daughter named Bella who was just diagnosed with cancer for a third time. So they've been on a long journey, and Rachel has actually written a book that goes into all that she's learned along this journey, right? And the book is called Listen, You Need a Break. And it's really for anyone looking to connect with peace in a challenging situation. And it's kind of a mosaic of life lessons and a guide to nurturing yourself for a more peaceful and fulfilling and a balanced life, right? So we'll be talking about some of those lessons, such as the importance of and how to go about grounding yourself. Uh, we'll be talking about how to best deal with your emotions and also the power that vulnerability can have on your experience. Uh, we're talking actually a lot about some of my favorite topics and things that have helped me along my own journey too. Uh, so I'm super stoked to introduce you all to her so she can share her experience and lessons with you all. All right, now let's go meet her. Cause it's here where we lay in my blanket of despair Where I'm weak but I'm strong and black smoke fills the air Hi, Rachel. It's so good to meet you face to face. Yeah, same to you. Yeah. Yeah, I'm excited you're on. You know, I was speaking with your daughter, Bella, last year. Uh, we did a podcast episode where we spoke about her experience as a child with cancer. And I was just blown away. Like, I really was by her ability to kind of cope and handle the stress that she was dealt in a very healthy and mature way. And I think she kind of gets some of this from you. I do, because I read your book. And, you know, it turns out there's a lot of good that came out of your cancer journey. And, you know, by good, I mean, like, you really have a good sense of presence now. And you're really able to kind of find the peace and the chaos. And you understand yourself so much better and your needs. And you're vocal about those needs, which is fantastic. <laughs> and so I wanted to bring you on today to, you know, talk about what was it in your cancer journey that kind of led to these discoveries? Because, I mean, we all know that if you have a child who is sick, I mean, when is there actually time that you can take for yourself? And so I wanted to just bring you on. I don't know if you can talk about maybe in the beginning, you know, what was that breaking point that you had where you realized that you had to essentially put your own oxygen mask on first before you could care for Bella? Well, that is a really good question, and thank you so much for having me. I think it's really important to talk about these topics. Um, they're kind of taboo, and I think it's really good to have this have these conversations. So uh, thank you for having me here. Yeah. Um, I would say for me, the breaking point really happened before Bella was even diagnosed, um, I learned how to put my own oxygen mask on, so to speak, um, many years before, uh, all of this happened. So I feel grateful to have some kind of grounding, uh, in place, um, because I feel like that really helped me in the beginning, um, to deal with the shock that came with um, learning of such a critical um, medical situation that, that she was in. We were all very blindsided. You never think that's going to happen. Um, even going into uh, that first, you know, pivotal MRI where they let us know what was going on, you know, it really just didn't even cross our mind that that was um, what was happening. We, we were thinking it was all these other, you know, different things while she was having these symptoms. Um, so shock what really was a big part of it in the beginning. And I'm so grateful to have had some sort of grounding that I've been working on years before um, to hold me in that space um, so that I could move forward with, with the processing, with the, with the process of processing. <laughs> <Yeah>. um, <laughs> um, so I would say uh, 
that was probably the breaking point happened before she was diagnosed. And then it just grew um, more and more um, as we went along. Yeah, because when you have a diagnosis like that, you have so much coming in from you from so many different directions. Mm -hmm. so I imagine it's mm -hmm. incredibly overwhelming. And one of the things you're talking about grounding right now, and that's one of the things that you talk about in your group in your book. And it's really not as difficult as we think it may be, or it's really not something we need to set time aside for. I mean, it's simply just being present in the moment that you're in. And in the book, you talk about several grounding techniques. Can you go into some of those techniques? Absolutely. Um, yeah, I would agree with you that grounding can happen all day long if you if you allow it to. And it is simply just uh, being present in the moment and really connecting with your own breath. Um, one of the best things that you know, you could do to help practice getting into that is to recognize when you are holding your breath, because we do hold our breath in our chest and we do the things and we just kind of get out of our body. We're pretty much conditioned to be in our head at all times mm -hmm. and not in our body. Um, so one of the easiest ways um, to practice all day long is just to become aware of when we are holding our breath and to take deep long breaths that go all the way into our stomach. Um, so that is something we could do all day long and have access to at any moment. Um, some other things that uh, are really helpful for grounding and are my personal go-tos is being connected with some kind of nature. Um, when I feel overwhelmed with emotion, my go-to is to get my shoes and socks off and get out into the yard and walk around on the earth. Um, I live near the beach, and so I'm grateful to be able to run down to the ocean at 15 minutes away and take my shoes and socks off and just walk along the, the wet sand. Um, those things ground me very quickly. Um, being in the sun, uh, maybe taking a walk uh, in the woods, anything that is related to nature that I have access to uh, are my go-tos. Um, I personally am a very drawn to water. I want to be around water. I want to be in water. Um, so taking a shower um, is very helpful to me or being in any kind of body of water um, grounds my nervous system. And it's it's really helpful. And those are things that um, I go to often, <laughs> multiple times a week. I'm, I'm trying to get into nature as often as possible. Uh, because it really is helpful and we all have access to it at all the time. You know, it's not something that we have to sign up for or have money for or any of that. It's accessible and it works. Uh, and that would, that would probably be my number one thing is to get into some kind of nature. Yeah, that is, that helps me too. I also live near the beach. I just oh, live nice. a few blocks away. So that helps <laughs> me ground myself too. And one of the things you mentioned in your book too that I liked was about movement and stress mm -hmm. and stretching to ground yourself. And I think that's so important because we carry all of that stress and that trauma in our bodies. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you mentioned several <coughs> techniques in there. The other one that I liked that you had mentioned was the five, four, three, two, one technique. Mm -hmm. And I always forget, I learned this several years ago, but I always forget like five things you, you can tell me, five things you see it's five things you see, uh, four things uh, that you hear, three things that you can touch, and then there's um, taste, and oh my gosh. It is. <laughs> it's hard. We have to like think of our six senses. I know. The point is yeah. to get grounded into our, you know, our, our human body, you know, we're in this human experience where everything is sensory, you know, yeah. we, you know, so if we can kind of, sometimes it'll feel, especially when you are having anxiety, everything feels very large. And so if you can kind of like 
just zone into your your own awareness uh, it helps you to calm down. So just going through and you can do it in any order you want. There's no rules like you can. It, it's just it's it's an exercise for just kind of humility, you know, feeling humble, mm-hmm. you know, feeling like you are you are smaller than than you think, you know, you're that's one of the reasons why I love to go to some kind of big body of water or big, you know, mountains or woods or something like that that reminds me of how small I am um but the but the five four three two one is really good with just helping you to kind of get back into your body get back into your senses and um it's it's a good exercise to use yeah, I think it's great. Um, and even if you don't remember, because I can't remember that what we were just the five, four, three, two, one, and which one. I know. I feel three. very out of it right now, a little bit, anyways. So I'm just like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> oh, no worries. Um, I loved that technique though because it gave me something tangible and something to focus on. Yeah. Because when we're in, when we're feeling, it's so hard to get out of our head and to think like, okay, I'm focusing on four things I can see or something mm-hmm. like that. It gave me something to focus on, which naturally brings me into the present moment. And I'm such a sensory person, so that helps me. And for me, it's sound. So even if I don't remember all the steps, I pretty much just say, okay, I'm gonna focus on what I hear right now. And it just mm-hmm. brings me in the zone. So I love that you mentioned that one in your book, because I think that's such a helpful one. Uh, can you give me a situation that you are in where grounding just became absolutely essential? Um, yeah, I mean, I would say if, if we're, if we're talking about, you know, my daughter's health journey, um, you know, grounding has been very, very, very important, uh, in going through all of this. Um, my daughter was just recently diagnosed for the third time in six years, Um, so it was, um, again, very shocking. Um, the feeling of like being so confident that it's over and then, um, getting that news that it's come back was just incredible. I mean, it was just a feeling that, um, just completely blindsided everyone. And so for me, grounding became like, like really what needed to happen um, in those, in those initial moments. And, and even more so, because when you're in your life, and you're just going along with, you know, the things that need to get done and going to work and, you know, mixing some rest in there, mixing some play and just trying to do your life. When something happens that completely just flips everything over. You don't know what day it is. You don't know where you are. Like, it's just, it's so, um, it just makes you disoriented. And so grounding is very, very, very essential when you feel like you're out of control. And um, so I would say that, you know, those, those times, definitely brought in uh, the the need for extra grounding for sure. So, I mean, we're talking now obviously about grounding and creating stillness and bringing in presence and this sort of mindfulness, you know, it's really important when we're talking about our emotional well-being because, you know, with practice, you're able to kind of step outside of yourself to observe your emotions versus getting so swept up in them. And I think this is an incredibly difficult skill to master. I feel like Mm -hmm. it took me years. Uh, So is there anything that you can say to parents that may help them get to this point where they can sort of step outside of themselves to observe and assess a situation versus just immediately reacting emotionally to it? Yeah, I mean, I cannot sit here and say that I've mastered this. (laughs) I, (laughs) and I, I definitely put it into my life every day. Um, but I, I, I don't just go straight into grounding, you know, I have emotional, uh, response, um, you know, uh, like 
great emotional responses. Um, for me, it looks like sobbing, crying, you know, like I really um, had a hard time uh, accepting this news and like my body just kind of rejected it almost. Uh, I had loss of appetite. I wasn't able to eat for like three or four days straight. Like it just, my body just said no, like, and I just kind of felt like I was in a dream and I was really, really scared and, you know, uh, really sad and, um, really confused. And so for me, the grounding was important and I was able to use the tools that I have, but I allowed myself to feel all of it, you know, like I knew that I needed to let the things that were coming up, come up. So if I felt like I needed to cry, then I need to cry. If I felt like I needed to scream then I needed to scream. And, you know, grounding is really good for weaving those two things together. It's not grounding is not a replacement for feeling your emotions emotions being felt, I feel like are extremely important in any type of crises and giving yourself the permission and the space to do it. Um, oftentimes I know for me anyway, I struggle with, you know, going into like manager mode, going into, you know, what needs to get done? Let's make a plan, you know, logic, 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 you know, it's kind of my, um, my way of feeling like I have some kind of control. Um, but I am a human being and I am feeling all of these very heavy emotions as well. So it's like a balancing act. So the, the grounding for me is just like, um, a space holder for those two things if that makes any sense. No, it makes complete sense. I mean, the biggest po- takeaway from what you're just saying now is that you lean into those moments. Mm-hmm. And I know that you're a fan of Eckhart Tolle too. I'm a huge mm-hmm. fan. I mean, his book, The Power of Now, completely changed my life. Uh, and I was a while back, I listened to a um, an interview that Oprah did with Eckhart. And they were talking about just this. You know, Oprah had said this was changed her life too, is, you know, not denying the moment and that resisting it really only creates more anxiety, Mm -hmm. more unhappiness. And, you know, they were saying too that, you know, it's not actually the situation that you are in that's causing the unhappiness and anxiety, but it's the mind and what the mind is telling itself. And so learning how to observe it so it doesn't control you is really important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, So one of the things you had said in your book to quote, because I love, I love what you said here, you had said that emotions were not my enemies but rather pathways to a deeper understanding of myself and the world around me. I love that. Can you expand on that and maybe talk about how emotions led you to have a deeper understanding of yourself in the world? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I really wasn't, um, really wasn't friends, I guess you would say with my emotions, because my entire life I've had really big emotions. And so I would kind of get put into a category of too much. You know, I felt too much. Um, I was too sensitive. Uh, I overreacted um, a lot of different things. And I would say that I had that um, response because I did not know how to regulate my emotions. Um, So I was a person that felt them as opposed to a person that kept them down, you know, inside and put a smile on my face. I was not that person that felt on the, on the inside and everyone just thought I was just happy all the time and everything was great. I definitely was the opposite. Like you definitely knew how I felt, you know, I, I did not hide a lot of things, um, a lot of emotions, but I was not good at regulating them. And I think for me, um, that's when I really started to understand, first of all, that it's okay for me to have feelings of anger and sadness and disgust and all of these different negative emotions that 
otherwise society tells us we're not supposed to feel. Um, when I learned that we are supposed to feel those things, um, it, it was, it changed a lot for me because I was able to allow myself, give myself permission to feel these emotions that were negative and learn how to feel them and respond in a healthier way. And I feel like those things completely um, changed how, how I was feeling emotionally and how I carried myself emotionally. Yeah. Uh, I mean, emotions are so hard to deal with. And I think some of the things that people find difficult when it comes to handling our emotions, you know, it's accepting them, like what you're just saying and allowing yourself to feel it's, you know, validating them, like you were just saying too, and kind of working through them and learning from those emotions. And vulnerability actually plays a critical role, I think, in all of this. And my favorite line in your book, we're getting to another quote, because I love your book. I think it's very helpful. And you had said, embracing vulnerability was not about being fearless, but about being willing to face my fears. Why is vulnerability so important? And what did you find was the hardest thing to be vulnerable about? Oh, vulnerability is so important because vulnerability is what I believe is the gateway to like being like really loving, like really, truly experiencing love because vulnerability allows you to be authentic. You know, it, it, it allows all the cards to be laid out. It allows everything to be real and not hiding anything or holding anything back because you don't, you know, want anyone to see that part of you or you don't um, want to talk about that or whatever, you know, vulnerability is the piece that opens everything up. You know, um, they say that people are, are, more afraid of public speaking than they are of death. <laughs> and I find that really like, wow, because public speaking or talking in front of people puts you in the very vulnerable state because you are putting yourself on the line for all of these thoughts to be in your head of like, what are people thinking of me? What are people saying about me? Do I sound that? I mean, it is, just a um a really really hard thing to do for a lot of people because of the vulnerability that is involved and so um it's a hard thing for people because we're not really um we're not really connected with how we're feeling and if we're not connected with how we're feeling then we're not really like secure like we don't feel the security of like, this is okay. It's okay for me to make a mistake. It's okay for me to, you know, not, not um, follow everything exactly to a T of how it's supposed to be. And um, if, if we really embraced uh, all of ourself and, and really gave ourselves grace and Hey, we don't have to be perfect you know, then that makes it easier to be vulnerable because then we're secure more in, in ourselves, and then we can put ourselves out there easier. Yeah. I mean, I think it's because I had a problem with this my entire life, like opening up or just being vulnerable at all. It just wasn't an option for me for the longest time. But when you do, when you learn that and when you do it, it's, I don't, for me, it was kind of such a release like such mm -hmm. a burden lifted and just putting it out there. And I still do it to, to this day. Like if I feel debilitating anxiety or depression, I'll just tell someone, I'm just like, yeah. you don't need to respond. You don't need to fix it. Just, this is what I'm feeling. And I just need to put out in the right. universe. And by doing that, I instantly felt better just for yes. it being out there. And I kind of noticed too, well, two things. One, I feel like I developed confidence through that. Like almost mm -hmm. just accepting who you are and realizing that you're human Mm -hmm. And that this is just life. And I think that helped too. And another thing too, that I think vulnerability opens up is our relationship with other people. It's just like, you know, more authentic and real and you get more connected 
I mean, I just feel a lot stronger connections with people being just completely open, open, honest, and vulnerable. But yeah, and so that's one of the things too that you talk about in your book is that, you know, the great thing about being present and living mindfully is that it improves so many other aspects of your life. And so if someone starts practicing this, what other areas of their life can they see improvements in? Well, you know, you mentioned relationships, and I think that that is such a key to um, being human is is having human connection with other people, you know, having we're not here by ourselves. And we're not here alone for a reason. And, you know, I think that it's very important to be vulnerable with people at the same time to feel safety. I think safety is very important. Uh, when you are building connections with people, you want to feel um, safe to be vulnerable. And that may take some time uh, because I think that it's important to uh, build trust uh, with people that you meet and then you can feel more safe and then you can le lean into more vulnerability and more in a deeper connection. Um, so I would say that when you are practicing these things yourself, then you are, a, then it literally affects everything you do. Like it affects your relationships. It, refl it affects the situations that you go into. Life is a wild roller coaster ride. There are no, you have, you have these plans and these visions of what you want your life to be and what you, where you feel like you're going. And then you get just completely derailed by whatever it is and having these tools in place every single day of your life, it really helps you to um, handle change like that abrupt change or a crisis or something of that nature and um it helps you to stay aware and present in the moment and um for me currently in a crisis situation <clears throat> it helps me to connect with my peace so that i don't feel like i'm so much in a storm but i'm in the eye of it and I can ground myself and feel the peace in it within myself as I'm watching this storm go around me. So um, I, I would just say that um, practicing uh, mindfulness and vulnerability is essential to um, living the most like peaceful life full of, of gratitude and love and it just affects everything it it affects every aspect of of your life for sure yeah it really does and those were some great points that you just brought up <laughs> and you know that sort of all builds into our emotional intelligence and i know you said that was a game changer for you and so i'm wondering can you give me an example of you know how you would have responded to something before you learned how to recognize and work through your emotions and then how would you respond now in that same situation? Oh man, I would say that um, my experience has been pretty chaotic, you know, uh, as a child, a teenager, just, you know, like I was mentioning before, I just, I never really understood how to regulate my emotion. Um, so anything that was happening and also, you know, the society that I was brought up in, the, the society that we're in is very, um, you know, uh, chaotic geared, like we're all just kind of um, fueled by a lot of fear and, and excitement, you know, and sometimes the excitement can be very negative. Um, so for me, I was, I was already feeling very chaotic. I, I didn't really know how to truly connect to um, my own peace uh, for many, many years. And so when I started to learn um, how to do that, it was little by little by little. And I just keep um, like collecting all of these tools along the way. Uh, but how I would handle a, a situation before um, would, would not be uh, uh, beneficial to me or anyone else. <laughs> you know, it just, it was, I was very, very reactive 
And um, so I would, so to answer your question, you know, I would handle a situation before in a very reactive way, whereas now I'm handling situations in a more responsive way and, and more um, aware, like I'm, I'm just a lot more aware of myself and, and regulating my emotion. So when you, cause Bella's, she's on her third diagnosis. She's, and so this is her third time and you recently just found out about this. Mm -hmm. So how was your reaction? Maybe the first time that she was diagnosed versus how did you react this time when it, when it came back? Yeah. You know, the first time was very uh, similar to this third time. And I guess the reason why is because um, there was just a lot of shock involved. Um, That first time it just, I had no idea that was even a thought. I didn't know what was going on. Uh, The way that they were just kind of explaining things was just really confusing. Um, It was very, you know, she had an MRI and they immediately admitted her to the hospital. It was a a lot happening right there. And um, I was very scared, very confused. And then this time around, um, it was it was almost the same. I mean, they did not admit her. Um, so that was, that was a different thing. Um, but it was still just like, so shocking that this was happening again. I mean, even to the point where Bella and I looked at each other when the doctor, you know, told us about the scan and after after the appointment, which was only, you know, maybe 10 minutes long we're just looking at each other and she's like ah I thought he was gonna say just kidding and I'm like I I mean we were just um we just couldn't believe it you know Bella feels great she has no symptoms whatsoever like she's living her normal life of you know working school making new friends Uh, She's very creative. She's always making something. She has three cats she takes care of. You know, we just really were thinking we were in the energy of moving forward, you know, so um, it was very shocking. Um, So I, I allowed myself, I mean, it took a couple of weeks. I know you and I were even supposed to do this podcast a couple of days after her scan Uh, And I had to reach out and say, I I can't do this right now because I was just so overwhelmed with emotion. Um, I was just gliding through the day. I mean, I just, it was, I felt like I was in a dream. Um, It was really difficult. I couldn't stop crying. Like it was, and then I'm, I'm having to also, you know, take care of this and that, do the adulting. You know, that's one of the things that, when um, you're going through some kind of really um, deep emotional, whatever that looks like, and there's so many reasons why a person would go through um, a heavy emotional experience, having to do the things like laundry and making dinner, and like all of that is just like, you just, you're just out of it. And um, I'm grateful that I have people in my life that are that show up and, you know, hold me when I'm a mess and help me with things. And I think that I'm, that it, when a person is going through something like that, it's really, really important to um, reach out to the people that you feel the safest with and that you feel like you can um, ask their help. Um, because, that is a part of what gets me through. I'm not just sitting over here doing this on my own. I can't, I I cannot carry all of this myself. And we weren't meant to. No, no. And I think that that is kind of what trips us up a lot of the times is because, you know, in our culture, it's always like hyper independence, you know, and it's just, to me, that's really toxic because it's just kind of teaching you to handle everything on your own and everybody is a, up against each other. And we're not, we're meant to live in communities. We're meant to lean on each other and um, 
it's hard for a lot of people to do because they look at, they feel like that is weakness to lean on other people. And so I'm just grateful that I know, um, I know different and I definitely lean on my people and I'm, I'm really grateful for that. So, uh, yeah, it was, it was about the same, same kind of reaction from the first to, to now, um, with a big balance of still feeling and honoring my emotions as they come up, taking time for myself, even if that is going on a drive alone, um, calling a friend, um, there are a lot of things that I do, uh, to fill my cup, so to speak. I think it's really important to fill your cup in however way that looks like to you so that you are able to show up for your child that needs you. Because there's two, there's two parts of this, you know, like there's the emotional, uh, aspect of, of, a, of a health condition. And then, uh, there's what to do, you know, you gotta get in there and be like, okay, what's the plan? You know, what's, what are we going to do about this and that? And I have turned into like an insane researcher, you know, looking up things every single day, um, making a list of all of the things that we could do to help her. And, um, it could be really exhausting, uh, mentally. So it's really important to have that balance where I'm like, okay, I'm going to take a break from this and I'm going to go outside. And I think it's, um, it just involves a lot of, I have a lot more discipline now, I think, um, with this time, just all of the, like I give myself more permission and I don't have those little voices in my head that are like, you know, you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't, um, take any time for yourself. You know, I know better. And I know that what I'm doing is taking care of myself so that I could be a better mom. I could be a better friend. I could be a better daughter, you know, all of the things. Um, so I, I, I know that from the first time to this time, I have grown a lot more. Um, and I put, I put my needs first so that I can be better for everyone else. Yeah, which is necessary at this kind of at this time. You really need to to protect your peace. I'd like to give you the floor now, uh, just to, to. I don't know if there's anything that we talked about that maybe you weren't able to mention, and then also give you the opportunity to talk about your book. Yeah, thanks. I mean, I I wrote the book because I just felt like it was really important um, for people to have access to different ideas and modalities that I have used to get through really hard times. And, you know, a cancer diagnosis for me, for, for anyone, especially your child is very hard. It is not a club that anyone wants to be a part of. Um, however, there are other situations in life too, that are really hard, you know, and all of it is relative. I would never, compare one person's tragic situation with another person's tragic situation. They're all different. So I wrote the book so that people could have access to things that are easily accessible, such as grounding, you know, grounding is such a huge deal. Um, and it's totally free, <laughs> you know, like a lot of it is, you can do it right now, every day. Um, you know, earlier in the conversation, you mentioned movement, you know, movement is a huge thing, you know, getting out, walking, moving your body, even dancing, like getting, shaking your body. Like you can get a lot of your energy out that way and emotions, um, moving your emotions around, um, you know, getting, getting still, you know, in your body. Uh, for me, I started taking yin classes um, in these different poses and movements for really long periods of time and, and slower. Um, so for me, it was helpful to ground in that, um, that slow energy while everything was going chaotic around me. So even though chaos is not something that 
I want to have in my life all the time, it is something that's familiar. So I actually, I know chaos. I, I don't know a whole lot of peace. <laughs> so <laughs> it, it's harder for me to, to stay still and to just connect and just be. And, you know, one of the things that I love about, um, you know, the people that would lead these classes is they would say things like, there's nothing to do. There's nowhere to be. You're here for the next hour. My phone was in the next room. It was, I had no responsibilities. It was just me connecting with my peace and learning how to connect with my peace has been absolutely crucial to, um, this whole life experience because you can access it at any time. Things don't have to be peaceful for you to access your inner peace. Mm -hmm. And um, so writing the book was just me wanting to put down on paper different ways where people can um, have access to respite. And that's what respite is to me. It is connecting with my peace in all these different ways and giving my, giving myself permission to do it at any point and not needing to earn it. A lot of people think, well, when this is over, then I'll slow down. Or when this is, when I'm done with this, then I will, um, you know, do something peaceful. No, like you, you have to do it during and you can find ways during the day um, to fit those things into your daily life. And that was that was the reason behind writing the book was I just wanted to share with as many people as possible how to do that um, so that maybe hopefully people can just take a deep breath and know that it's going to be okay and and have some tools yeah yeah and your book I mean it's meant for everyone not just cancer families I mean people like me or just anyone that's not even familiar with that journey uh, or having experienced uh, where can people find your book and buy it and how can people find you if they have any questions or would like to reach out yeah so uh, my book is available on Amazon um, it's called, um, listen, you need a break and, um, you can also find me social media wise at respite with Rachel on Instagram as well as Facebook. And I do like to share, um, any new tools that I come across, uh, just as supporting, people in slowing their life down, especially in, in a crisis. Well, great. For those listening, I guess the book again was, listen, I need a break. And I'm going to provide a link to Amazon on your book in the description for anyone that's interested in looking into it. Uh, but yes, thank you for coming thank on today. You. I really appreciate it. I love this topic and talking about this kind of stuff because it's so important. It really is. Thank you so much for having me.